That's Corpus Christi's own Shake the Nation. You can catch them leading worship at Bay Area Fellowship every weekend. The anthem and 13 other great tracks are available on their CD, Follow. Get it on iTunes or any of your favorite music distribution centers. This is Social Bites, Corpus Christi's cutting-edge audio magazine. Thank you for joining us today as we talk with Pastor Bill Cornelius of Bay Area Fellowship, one of the area's leading visionaries and one of America's most influential young pastors. Pastor Bill, thank you so much for speaking with us. So uh, can you tell us a little about Bay Area Fellowship? Well, we started the church about 13 years ago, and uh, it was just my wife and I and our one six-week-old baby at the time in our little apartment. And uh, it's grown and, and into a, a great ministry that's uh, been able to touch a lot of lives, and we're just excited to be part of it. And how's the ministry shaped? What's the inspiration behind it? Well, frankly, it just comes down to one thing. We want to really reach out to people who uh, have been disenfranchised from the typical church or have never been to church in their life at all. And so our, our really our goal is to be a church for the unchurched. And, and, and that's your vision uh, for Bay Area Fellowships, is that right? It really is. It's to impact the whole community and, and anyone who does not uh, feel comfortable in a typical church environment, we want to make feel comfortable in our church environment. And uh, you mentioned that the, the church has grown uh, substantially. Mm-hmm. And uh, how do you run the organization as the lead pastor? Well, you know, we've got about 8,000 people coming on the weekends, and uh, when you have that many people, there's no way one pastor could actually, uh, you know, keep up with the needs of that many people. So we have a whole team of people to do it. Uh, we, first of all, have a small group ministry that, that uh, captures a lot of the needs right there. People can be ministered to, get to know one another, um, as well as um, have an opportunity to, to grow closer to one another through those friendships. And then also we have a, a team of pastors of about 50 people that keep up with all the other areas of ministry. Wow. And so um, is your uh, organization a, a mission and, and, and objective-driven? Absolutely. We have to have clear goals and dreams. Uh, you know, for a church to, to, to go from, you know, zero to 8,000 people, you have to have some goals along the way to, to, see that, to see that happen. And not to say that the God doesn't play a role, but I believe God uses our goal setting in the role of the growth. What do you like best about hitting an organization like, uh, like Barrier Fellowship? Well, you know, what the, the funnest part about my job is that we, we really get to see in a tangible way what happens when you live by faith. And so it's a lot of fun to, to just kind of throw out an idea that God's given you and you say, hey, I think this is what we're going to do next. I think this is what God wants us to do next. And to see people rally behind the idea and then really see it grow into something even much larger than you ever dreamed. And we've seen that happen so many times now. It's just gotten to be fun. Can you give us an example of, of something like that that's happened here? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think one of the most obvious examples this last year would be Easter. For us, you know, we started off uh, doing a little giveaway as an illustration to talk about how God gives us heaven for free. We were going to give away a car, and it went from one car to uh, one car per service to one car per campus uh, to where basically we ended up giving away 17 cars. Awesome. Um, then it grew from that to furniture sets to over four and a half million dollars of the products given away in one weekend. Yeah, so that's really where you see the hand of God really moving in, in a place like Barrier Fellowship. Absolutely, people just all jump in and get involved. And my favorite part of that was uh, when they gave away over three hundred bikes to kids in need on the West Side. That was really cool to see. That's awesome. So, what do you like least about running an organization this size? You know, I think I have to say the the least. Uh, the, the, the part that I don't like the most, I would say, would be the very word you're using, organization. I think sometimes we forget that a church is an organism, it's a body, it's a, a bunch of believers that, that's a family of Christ. But because it is so large, there is a business aspect what we do, that we have to face the facts that there's bills to pay, there's a mortgage, there's you know, there's a payroll and, and all those kinds of things. And Absolutely. so I think that's just the reality. And so uh, I do have to at times, you know, had to live within the constraints of the fact that we are a, a nonprofit organization. And so sometimes that becomes a reality whenever you have to, you know, have personnel policy handbooks and stuff like that. I mean, you know, those are just things that you really didn't think, okay, Lord, I didn't sign up for that. Right. Uh, right. But that's all part of the course as well. As well. Yeah. And I think that's a part of, uh, of if, you, if you'd ask business owners throughout the area or throughout the, the country, I think that's an aspect of the business that they that most of them don't really uh, care to have to deal with but it's sure. it's something that uh, that needs to be taken care of yep what's what's your vision of in the next five years for Bay Area Fellowship where do you see Bay Area Fellowship uh, in five years five years from now I see us continuing to do what we're doing uh, with television taking the gospel all around the world um, I also see us continue to expand our campuses I think there's going to be a day that there's uh, not eight campuses like there is now but maybe 30 campuses. Uh, 30 to 50 campuses, not only meeting around South Texas, but also around the world. 
And uh, one of our goals is to also have international sites. We'd like to start some of those in Mexico um, as well as other uh, parts of the world. And so that's really our heartbeat is just continue to take the, the same passion and compassion that God's given us for people to be saved and, and their lives change and just take it all over the globe. Yeah. And, and so you're parlaying uh, the the uh, the business model or mm-hmm. not necessarily a model, a sure. business model, but sure. the organization model here uh, in, into other mm-hmm. areas. Absolutely. We're basically franchising church. Uh, the way God has shown us to do it um, elsewhere. And so we're just continuing to expand it. That's great. That's great. And what what are the biggest challenges you see for Bay Area Fellowship in the next five years? The next five years, I think the challenge is going to be for us to shift from being a one-site church with supported sites to really seeing it as multiple sites to where instead of just having sort of what we call the hub and then all the other branches, but to where we have multiple hubs, multiple large congregations um, that are spread out around the globe as well. So it's not just a one big church and then with a lot of smaller branches, but we have multiple big churches. Ah, that's a, that's a very interesting model. So you're looking at, uh, at creating uh, branches in bigger cities, obviously, right. uh, that would have a, a similar size as the main church here in Corpus Christi. Exactly. It's wow, very, exactly. very interesting. Okay. So tell us about your new book, I Dare You to Change. What well, was... we're, we're excited about it. You know, God's really been blessing it. Um, it basically, it, it's a step-by-step practical how-to guide to change. For anyone who says, I want to change uh, and go from being um, discouraged and depressed to being happy or go from being broke to having some some affluence or go from, you know, uh, being an employee with without a lot of a future to going to being an employer, uh, owning my own business. I mean, whatever the change happens to be, or maybe it's simple as saying, I just want to make, feel closer to God. Whatever the changes that you're looking for, there are some simple steps that you see in the Bible that people t- took to change any area of their life. And so those are laid out with a guy by the name of Gideon in the Bible based upon Judges chapter 6 through 8. And so basically we just took that model and said, you know what, that'll work for any area of your life. The reason why God lets us see people's lives change in the Bible is so that we can mimic what they're doing so we can see those changes in our lives too. Right. I think uh, I think one of the things that you touched on uh, in the book is the biblical basis of it. And I think we've seen, we will see multiple lives uh, throughout the Bible uh, where God gives us examples of change and, and how we can take those models that he placed in the Bible and, 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 and put them into our lives and put them into practice. I think, uh, you know, if you look at the life of, of Joseph, sure. uh, for example, or oh, Nehemiah, he's a great example. Um, yep. you know, it, it's something that we see over and over. So I think you touched on something that, uh, and you have to actually put your finger on something that we see over and over throughout mm-hmm. Scripture uh, on how God has done that. I think it's a great thing. Thank you. What message do you have for the modern family, the kind of family that would uh, attend or visit Bay Area Fellowship? You know, my message for the modern family would be uh, simply to know that God has a purpose for you and that um, if you don't know your purpose, everything else seems like chaos. But even in the midst of chaos, if you know your purpose, there's a purpose behind it to where you think, okay, this may seem crazy. My schedule's nuts. And I feel like, you know, I'm a, if, if you're a mom and you're running your kids around to soccer practice and ballet and piano lessons, and you think, man, I just, a, I feel like I'm a taxi driver more than a mom. Once you begin to see your purpose that God has for you and being a mother, then it helps calm the nerves of the mom to say, you know what, there's a purpose behind all this. And it also helps you uh, decipher between things you want to be part of and things you don't want to be part of. So I think so many times we just, we somehow think that significance just means being busy, but we can really be really busy doing things that don't matter. And so uh, I really believe that the biggest message I would give families and individuals is to say, you have a purpose, God has put you on this earth for a reason. Once you figure out what that is, then it'll make sense of all the other relationships, all the dynamics and challenges that you have will suddenly fall into into place. Yeah. I think that's kind of the trap that uh, Pastor Rick Warren Mm -hmm. uh, talks about, aimless distraction that we find ourselves in. Uh, And and it is something that that is very evident in in life, in modern life. And I think uh, purpose is definitely... uh, the way to find that doorway to where, where God will get you into where, where you want to wake up in the morning, you want to go to exactly. work. Exactly. You, you want to get up. You don't have to have an alarm get you up because right. you, you want to wake up because you know what you're supposed to be doing. So what do you think some of the biggest challenges uh, are for uh, the modern man uh, mm-hmm. in, in today's world? And I really believe the biggest challenge today um, is having too much to do. Uh, meaning that I think there's so many options that are available and they're all good options nowadays. It's not like most people don't wake up in the morning and think, you know, do I want to be a really bad person today or do I want to be a good person? That's really not the choice. The choice is more like, well, I can do this, this or that, or I can do this, this or that. In other words, there, there are lots of 
good options, but that doesn't mean they're God options. It doesn't mean it's exactly what I'm supposed to spend my life doing. What is, what is God leading me to do? So I think that's the thing is, is to decipher between all those things and realize that just because something is something you can do doesn't mean you should do it. And so I think deciphering between all the good options and saying, this is my heart. This is why I was wired up to do. I want to do that. Yeah, that's a great message. Uh, I think, and, and that leads into focus and mm -hmm. focusing on on just the important things. You know, yeah. it's it's just so easy to get caught up in in the uh, the reality that that we live in, and, and that's just being distracted. And and, yeah. and I I think that's kind of a, a battle tactic of the enemy. You know, mm -hmm. he's trying to keep us away from focusing. And, and absolutely, I touched on that. And uh, I, I guess that would be kind of the same challenge for 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 the woman in, in the mm -hmm. world today and, and, and the family as a, as a general, you know, in general for the children. And, and Absolutely. It's, it's just so much uh, of that that's uh, evident in, in the world today. Now, kind of making a, a little bit, uh, taking our conversation more on a, on a local level, mm -hmm. um, what are your feelings on the, on the business climate here in Corpus Christi? You know, it's funny. Um, I have seen nothing but opportunity in front of me. Uh, but oftentimes what happens is there's there seems to be two distinct groups. The one area that I see struggling in our community the most um, is is uh, is the area in particular where people see a large city, but they but that city does not think like a large city. And so the one thing I'm constantly in, 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 in communication with um, different city council people that we're friends with, as well as the mayor is a good friend of mine and several other people that we we find that Corpus Christi is a large city with a small self-esteem. They don't think they're a large city. And so what happens is we end up turning down options that we could have for the city, uh, whether that be in industries or companies wanting to move here or different opportunities of development. Uh, when if we just looked at other cities around us, there are actually cities much smaller than us doing greater things, which means that all we have to do is just begin to think like they're thinking and say, wait a minute, we can do more than we're doing here. And so but so many times we, we turn things down. Uh, for really no apparent reason other than the fact that it involves change. And so I think I think really I would challenge our city as individuals, I would say, uh, for us to begin to think growth-minded, to begin to think progress, and begin to think how can we continue to expand uh, what we can become as a city. Very good. And as far as an objective that you would, mm -hmm. you would set uh, to reach a goal like that, what, what, would, what, would, what do you think would be like the number one thing that you, you think we could do beyond just changing attitudes? What's something tangible that we could do? Something tangible? I think something tangible we could do is we could create a business environment to help people win. I think one thing we could do as a city uh, to uh, to help the expansion of our city is to foster a growth environment, which means we realize that you don't just – uh, you don't just um, have schools that are improved, but you probably need new schools. And the reason why is because new schools um, attract new areas of growth. And then you've got people that are thinking, I want to, I want to maybe start a business down here. Well, how how can I? What is my incentive to come and start a business down here? Um, what kind of tax uh, opportunities are there to help us? You know, are, are there any kind of incentives for us to come and open a business here? Uh, when I get down here, am I going to see nice new schools that I'm going to want to put my kids in? Because these these people aren't just looking for tax incentives; they're also thinking, I got a family. Um, you know, how are, are the city treating? Um, you know, the the, uh, the businesses that are here, you know, are they helping them foster growth or are they just getting in the way? And so simple things like that, I think, really make a big difference. In other words, I think we need to improve the customer service towards the business owner, towards the corporation and say, what can we do to make sure almost like creating a liaison to the corporation and to the business owner to say, we want to be pro business, pro expansion. Let's go on the offensive and let's literally go out and let's attract them. Let's go, let's tell the world that Corpus Christi is a great place for you to come and expand your business. Let's give Michael Dell reasons why the next Dell found uh, corporation uh, should be built in Corpus Christi. Let's go give Exxon a reason why to come here. Let's go give, you know, um, you know, McDonald's corporation or whoever reason to say, this is a great place to do this. Let, let's show people our, how good our port is, which I believe is very sharp and how, you know, I you agree. can export from here instead of having to export from, from here. Houston and deal with the traffic in Houston. Why not Corpus Christi? So I think that's the thing is that we, it's not that we don't have good things going on. We need to communicate those good things better to the nation around us to say, we've got it going on. So come down and check it out. Yeah. I think if, I think if we had a, a, a citywide um, way to, to communicate the strategic plans that are already in place, I'm absolutely, sure, that would be uh, definitely something that would get us um, on 
the same level where we're all focused. I mean, right. it comes back to focus. If we can focus as a community, we can focus on, on making things better than we Absolutely. Well, you know, I talked to, I mean, I've talked to our mayor, I've talked to our city council, and they've got some great things going. They've got some great ideas in place. And the, I think the key is now is that we, we can't let the naysayers and, and, and the complainers uh, basically drown out the good messages that are being sent. And so I think it's just clarifying those messages and getting those out and saying, this is a place that we want you to grow. We want you to expand. It's, it's a ripe opportunity for a small business to really turn into a thriving industry. Yeah, and this is just a great time for that to, to it actually really take is. place. Great stuff. Thank you. What would be the single most important piece of advice uh, that you'd give up a startup business? You know, the, the number one thing I'll say if you're going to start up a business, that's a great question. We, we do a lot of mentoring with business leaders, and um, the number one thing I, I'm constantly going back to again and again is I tell a business leader that the one thing you're going to have to do, whether you like it or not, is you're going to have to be the number one salesperson. Most people in the business, they want to talk about their product. They want to talk about what they've developed, but they never want to talk about who they're selling it to. And so I always tell people, you actually have to have a sale before you can even have a good a process for it. So I, I think the best thing you can do is realize that you can't hire that salesperson. That's got to be you. You're the one who's going to sell your product. It's kind of like as an author, I realized one day that the publisher is really not responsible for selling my book. I'm responsible for selling my book. Mm -hmm. So I've got to tell reasons why they should why they should buy this and read it. In the same way, if you make a widget, you better be the you know using your widget, uh, expounding upon why everyone else should use it. And so I would say uh, you've got to be become good and comfortable at presenting what you have and why. Give me the benefits why I should utilize your product or service over someone else's and be comfortable with that. Yeah. In other words, at the end of the day, um, it's, I heard someone once say that, you know, drug dealers are so effective because they're smoking what they're selling. Mm -hmm. And so are we smoking what we're selling? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever it is that we have to offer, are we saying, hey, this is this is working in my life. The reason I feel so comfortable saying come to my church is because I can say it changed my life, so I think it can change yours too. You know, so if I'm selling a Honda, I better be driving a Honda. And so I think that's important. And so we need to be comfortable selling our own product. I agree. That's um, and I think you'll see in some of the the, the major organizations, uh, their leadership comes from the sales force usually, mm -hmm. and for the most part, you know, nothing happens until the sale gets done. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's a great piece of advice for for new startups, and it's so important. And and yes, it's important to go out and look for salespeople and sure. get that great salesperson. But sure. that, that's what I call gravy. Right. You know, you're covering the bills. Let the gravy exactly. cover the, the excess. Exactly. Yeah. You got to be the first great, the first and best salesperson that's for the company. Very good. Good stuff. Um. What about advice uh, for the new organizational leader uh, when they're first encountering their first experience with uh, adversity or crisis? What kind of advice would you give them? Sure. I would say that uh, when it comes to crisis, the one thing that gets everyone through crisis is relationships. And so if you focus on improving your relationships with your key vendors, um, if, you, if you have tight relationships with your key staff people or your managers, or if you're in a nonprofit with your, with your volunteers, then no matter what happens, what rocks the organization, it's the relationships that will keep everything together. And this is why some people look at a couple and something tragic happens in that couple's marriage and people say, wow, I can't believe she stayed with him. I can't believe he stayed with her. Why would they do that? Because see, what we don't see that they know about is the relationship they have. And so no one else sees that. So why does someone stay with a company when they when the company keeps downsizing and they're lowering everyone's pay? Because of relationships, because they say, no, I know this guy. They, they, they stood up for me. They were there with me when things were falling apart. I'm going to be there with them while things are falling apart because, you know what, there's going to be a better time. It's going to come around, and I want to still be with this company. And so relationships keep us together. In the same way, when you have a crisis or a difficulty, a relationship is what's going to hold you through that. And so one of the things I tell managers a lot is I tell them, look, if you want to really know how to keep your best employees, um, don't just pay them well. Love them. I know that sounds funny. You think, well, that's that's a funny term to be used in the business world. But you know what? Love them or lose them. You either love them or you'll lose them. And so really care for them, care for their family, care for what's going on in their life. I love that. It's a big deal. Love <laughs> yeah. them or lose them. I love that. Great. In terms, and I'm kind of going to go on a little bit lighter side now. Sure. A couple of last questions. Sure. Uh, in terms of media, uh, what do you listen to, read, or view on a regular basis for ideas, insight, and inspiration? And uh, how do you listen? Do you, you know, on your iPod or do you sure. use digital a lot? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I listen to, I, I listen, I download a lot of podcasts. Um, I love Catalyst Podcast. I think it's some of the best stuff out there. It's ministry and business related. Um, it's great stuff. One of the guys I listen to, one of my favorite preachers is Andy Stanley. Another good friend of mine, um, in fact, I was just with him this last week in Open, Oklahoma, is a guy named Craig Rochelle. Uh, he's a great author. He also wrote the foreword for my book, so I'm a little biased towards him, but he's been a good friend and mentor for a long time. So I listen to a lot of things that he teaches. 
Uh, but then also I love some of the standard stuff that most people like. Like I love good preachers like Bishop Jakes, uh, Joyce Myers is a lot of fun to listen to, or uh, uh, even uh, Joel Osteen. He's become a friend over the last few years. And so I listen to some of their stuff too, just for some inspiration at times. But then for the business world, I'm constantly looking for new material. Um, uh, you know, like I've been reading a book called Blue Ocean Strategy. It's a great new read. Um, uh, I've also uh, been prone to go to the internet for different uh, advice columns. I think if you're in, in business, if you want to know how to market your company, earlytorise.com is a great website to go check out. I think Guy Kawasaki has got some great stuff to teach. He wrote a book called The Art of the Start. Um, I think those are some great books to be uh, diving into. But of course, I think everyone should be reading I Dare You to Change by Bill Cornelius. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but hopefully those will be resources to help people. But actually, I, I wrote the book early on called Go Big also for pastors yeah. that are wanting to grow their ministries as well. But frankly, I, I think um, we can listen and learn from a lot of people. But one of the things I challenge people with when you listen to different people is if you keep listening to the same people all the time, you're not going to learn new ideas. You've got to be willing to go to different camps that you normally wouldn't get information from and listen to them. And you'd be shocked what you can learn from people who grew up very different than you did. Right. Yeah, that's that's vital. Yeah, so, just a, a good, simple change in culture absolutely. Uh, could just open a, a, an opportunity for you that you never saw coming. Yep. Um, what are your passions? What do you love to do in your free time, Pastor Bill? Oh, man. You know, I have a lot of passions. Um, I just love church, first of all. So, so one of the things my wife jokes about is that she says, you know, you're 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 a pastor, but your hobby is also being a pastor, and she's right. I mean, I, I love studying other churches. Like I'm the guy who I will pull over from a vacation and go walk through a church building. You know, she's like, you got to be kidding me. We're on vacation, you're walking through a church building, you know. So I think that's part of the just most guys that are driven. Whatever they do, they want to go see how other people are doing it too. So I got a friend who builds houses. He's the same way. He goes but through every model home in some other new city when he's there too, because that's what he does, you know. Yeah. So I do a lot of that, but also um, I really enjoy real estate. And so my wife and I have um, a couple of apartment complexes and some rental properties. And so we enjoy doing that as well. I don't manage them directly anymore. Now I have them managed, but I still enjoy studying real estate and uh, investments. And so that's that's pretty much what I do with my free time. And of course, uh, occasionally surf. I'm not about to call myself a surfer, okay, because the, the real surfers would be insulted by me saying that. I occasionally get on a surfboard when some of my friends force me to finally get out and, uh, you know, get into my bathing suit and go go hit the beach. And so, but we do that as a family. We go to the beach a lot. And we get a chance to travel because of what I do with speaking. Uh, sometimes I go speak different places, and that gives me an opportunity to go see different cities. So that's a lot of fun, too. Very good. Pastor Bill, it has been an extreme honor and a privilege to interview you. Uh, I look forward to many years together of growing together in your church and, and seeing what God has in store for us. Hey, thank you. God bless you. God bless you. The book is I Dare You to Change, available at Amazon.com or at your favorite bookstore. You can visit Pastor Bill on the web at www.billcornelius.com or by clicking on the link at our website. We'd like to thank all our program sponsors and encourage you to call or visit them online by clicking their links on our program page. For advertising and program opportunities, call 361-232-5204, visit us at www.socialbytescc.com, or email sales at socialbytescc.com. I'm David Flotus. This has been Social Bytes Business Edition, Corpus Christi's cutting-edge audio magazine. I invite you to like us on Facebook, forward our text message, and please press that share button. Remember, you are the network. <laughs>